I'm going to start it off with the first question, as is my right as the person holding this microphone. Bert, let's talk about this year. Um, so I know that one of the things you're alluding to was the, uh, the small actions within what you're doing and I personally have just noticed you a lot of like little things um, that you have just been really, really committed to. So the question that I'm wondering is like what are the, uh, the smallest things that you have implemented, whether it be a, a discipline, a, you know, a new line or a script or something like that, um, that you think has been the biggest needle mover for you? It's a great question. It's a loaded question too. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound redundant. A lot of you guys have probably heard this. Uh, floss. That's floss. what I was looking for. Every day. It's uh, changed my life. Shout out to Mike Dowd. I love how much you love that I floss. Uh, keep these pearly whites pearly. Uh, so honestly though, it sounds really stupid, but something like that is uh, something that changed my life like four years ago. So I flossed every single day for the last four years. And it's something that I hated doing before I got into the discipline. So I really just learned into like step into the, like the suck, which was like, I knew that when I started flossing, it wasn't going to be pretty for a few weeks. And I was just like that just compounded. So for me this year, I don't still, I, I'm getting more enjoyment out of it, but journaling, like I was a basket case in my head <laughs> this year and the power of journaling this year, whether it was a word or four pages in my hand cramped because I'm not a writer. Um, was allowed, it allowed me to get a lot of the thoughts that I had in my head, out of my head, to just clear my head space. I think a lot of us get emotional because we just have a lot of thoughts in our head that either we don't have a person we can talk to about it or you have a person you can talk to about it, you just forget to talk about it. Um, so journaling was a big one this year and specifically within the Cutco business, um, just painting the picture and using the word imagine a lot. So shout out to Kareem. Um, using the word imagine of imagine how it's going to feel like every single time you pull a pot or a pan out of your drawer, Mrs. Jones, it just works the way you want it to work every single time. Every single time you pull a knife out of your block, it just works the way you want it to work every single time. And just painting that picture. Um, so that was the, the little implementation that I did this year, specifically in the business that I think really helped sell a lot of package deals, a lot of big sets. Um, and a lot of small orders as well, but on the outside, again, journaling was a big one this year. I think Bert might be better at uh, dentist at getting people to floss. If the motivation <laughs> is selling a million dollars. All right, first question. Saw this hand first. Yeah. Let's get a mic runner down here, and then we'll go over to Pato next. And if anybody from this side of the room has any questions, get ready. Hello. Um, I'm wondering. When you guys are looking to implement a new skill or break habits at the booth that you know are holding you back and maybe uh, get some new scripts and really be able to deliver them when you're really in front of that person in the mode, um, what are some of the strategies from a maybe daily practice or do you kind of visualize it more? Like what are some things that really help you shift? Um, it can be for both of you. I would yeah, love to sure. I would say, so everybody learns differently and everybody implements differently. So again, I think it's important to like, again, we have auditory learners, we have visual learners, and we have kinesthetic learners, right? You're one of those three and you might be different parts of those three. So um, for me, I'm big and visual. Like my speech that I wrote, I typed the whole thing out word for word. That's just how I learn, that's how I perform, that's how I know because I, I have to do it. I don't, just have, I don't just have bullet points. Other people work the complete opposite. Like I know exactly what I'm going to say. I just need a bullet point to remember. So with scripts, it's like you got to embrace just not being good at something. And you have to be okay with letting go of perfection and do it in front of customers. Seth, where are you? How bad did our cookware script probably sound in 2018? Not good. But we still sold pots and pans. We still sold them. We sucked in comparison to what we are now. But we just leaned into change and leaned into being okay with stumbling and bumbling and losing our place. But we just kept doing it and the power of repetition is so real. So as far as implementation, again, literally for me, it's saying it out loud, reading it, but literally videoing myself, seeing how my eyebrows look, how I sound, my inflection points, all those things. Is it actually good or not? And if it's not that good, I got to keep working on it, right? And I'm still a work in progress, right? So I would, I would tell you every time, every person, everything. Um, I, I think what we do is we focus on that one script and then we're like, I'm going to nail this with every single person. 
well, every person that comes up to the booth is different. So the thing is, you can't do that. But if you're one of those people that are like, I'm going to do every script, show them everything, everyone will see everything that we have to offer, that's when you can start developing with the plug and play so that you're all like, oh, that worked with that customer. So that means that I did the right thing because I did it. I showed them everything, and now I'm picking up on those key things that will help me so that I get the right customer, then I can nail them with the right approach so I can plug it in at the same time. So I think that it's very important that you understand if you want to get really good, you got to do it every single time with every single customer, and then you're going to start mastering the levels or those areas of your script that you know work, and then you're going to go, this works every time, now I know what to do. Hello. All right. Oh, that's on and stuff. Uh, my question is for, for Curtis. Uh, you talked about making sure, you know, finding out if money is an issue and the approach and that is key. I've read a lot of different scripts that at different points have that price confirming question. If you could, if something fit in the budget today, would you consider getting something? Or is this fit in the budget without breaking the bank? Are there very specific points in your um, script where you do sort of confirm that price issue yes. or money issue and then set and or are there specific cues you get from a customer where you have to pivot off and really confirm that price issue um, very directly with the customer? Yes, yes, and yes. First thing I want you to do is quit saying budget. Take that out of your mouth. Okay. What a customer's budget has nothing to do with you, period. Okay. What they can budget, it's, it's kind of, I call the, when people say the budget word, I almost have like that pretty woman moment where I'm like, you're literally seeing if she can afford it or not by using the word budget, and it's a slap in her face. So what I would encourage you is not to say budget, but put it in a different way or a different limelight. If you could afford it today, is this something that you would like? Is this a little out of the price range that you can afford? Do you see what I'm saying there? When you say budget, you're, you're literally, oh. I don't, I don't, don't, just don't say budget. Um, <clears throat> so the thing that I would tell you is yes. What you need to do is you, get, you need to get really good at using verbiage that gets a customer to think about how expensive we are, right? High end, high quality, very expensive, one of a kind, luxury. You get what I'm saying? So when I'm doing that during my approach, the customer's going, oh, this stuff must be really expensive, right? And I'm listening to them when I'm saying those words, right? Have you ever, high end, have you ever seen something luxury? Are you looking for something that you buy once that you never buy again? We're very expensive. It's okay to use those words because then that customer is going to go, well, how expensive? Well, it just depends on what you're looking for, right? Or what you need or what you want, right? And then that customer is going, so is this like $1,000 for the set of knives? And they point at like, like the ultimate, and you're like, oh, you're way off. <laughs> right? And the customer, but when that customer says that money amount, that's what they're telling you they can afford, or that is the money that they're willing to spend at that moment. Does that make sense? So that's why I always ask the customer, well, how expensive do you think that is? If they're like, oh, that set's like 500, I'm like, oh, yeah, times six payments or five payments. Right? And then the customer's like, ooh. Yeah, we're high end, not low end. If you want low end, go to Target or Walmart. Okay, we're high end. You buy it once, it's American made, and it's guaranteed. You're going to pay for what you're seeing here today. And I would love to find out what helps you get it today. So let's go over what price you are willing to pay or what you're wanting. You get what I'm saying? And then I go in it that way with the approach. Does that help you? Don't say budget. Don't, don't do it. Curtis will find you. He's all over the country. All right. Next question. Seriously, nobody's got a question? All right. Vernon B. Williams V. Sorry, I didn't see you back there. He said it. I didn't say it. I was going to say it, but I didn't say it. Well, you were thinking it. Anyway. Anyone know that reference? Anyone? Thank you. All right, there's my old people. All right. Um, I have two questions. First one is for both of you guys who are ignoring me right now. Second one is uh, for you, uh, Curtis. First question for both of you. 
Um, if you had the opportunity to talk to your to yourself ten years ago, what 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 is the one piece of advice you would give yourself? I would tell myself, keep going. You haven't proved anything to yourself yet. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably invest in Bitcoin, probably. Um, <laughs> if we were to go back in time, that'd be cool. Um, dude, that's a great question. That's a really good answer by Curtis. Um, yeah, I would say 10 years ago, it's, uh, yeah, put in the work, right? Like, again, I, I don't really think that I was really disciplined in this job until like four years ago, really. Like COVID was the best thing that happened to me, I feel like, in the world where I dipped 200 grand in sales because I had to get real with myself. Am I actually as good as I am as I think I am at this? And I wasn't. Like, a lot of you think you're good. <laughs> We're just not that good yet, right? So I would say, like, be open to working really hard, but also, like, commit to your scripts Right? Because if you don't know the, again, like I think, was it Matt? Again, I'm just quoting Matt all day today. It's like the soil. I love that analogy. Right? Like your scripts are your soil. And it's like, I didn't commit to events for six years in the business because I thought you just lost money at events. And then Seth, thank God for Seth. He was like, dude, you're just not as, you're not actually good at the scripts <laughs> at all. I tried to handle an objection with him and he, I got like 17 seconds in. He's like, shut up. Like, you're not good at this. You're just not. So get really good at your scripts. If I were to go back in time, I would just get really, really good at the new customer approach and handling objections. The show doesn't suck. You do. Yeah. And to elaborate on what I was saying is 10 years ago, I, I was only selling like six, 700,000. And I was not. That paltry amount? <laughs> How are you scraping by? I, I, you were able to I, cover the mortgage everyone? Yeah. Well, what I was thinking to myself 10 years ago and why I would say that to myself is because I'm not financially or I'm not where I need to be to be happy with where I'm at, right? So 10 years ago, I was thinking that. Now I'm just like, oh my gosh, like how much longer? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, no, the thing is that when, we're, when we're, we're selling that, and the reason why I say this is because Many of you in this room don't understand that when you make the jump from 200 to 400, it gets real. But when you go from 400 to 600, life becomes a little bit easier. And then when you jump from 600 to a million, baby, let's go, okay? And then once you go from a million to where we're at now, it's like, this is, this is where the gold is at. You know what I mean? And that's why I would tell myself that 10 years ago, now I'm just like, let's keep going. Like, dreams are happening, things are coming together, life is real. So, hang in there, keep working as hard as you can, because once you guys start making those jumps, you're literally gonna go, oh, like, I don't have to work paycheck to paycheck, I don't have to worry about where my next paycheck comes, I don't have to worry about how many customers I need to get on my database, I don't need to know what that catalog is gonna sell, I don't need to know how much that email is gonna bring in, right? Now it's just like, oh cool, Amy sent out an email yesterday, I got nine orders right away, I'm like, okay, 4K for the week, Woo, that cruise was amazing, you know what I mean? So, just keep going. Vernon, second question. Second question. Thank you. <laughs> Side note, don't ever ask Seth Kinzer, or don't answer his question if he asks you what you sold the previous year. If you haven't sold like 800 grand plus, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, all right, so Curtis, so with your like want versus need thing, I've heard you talk about that a couple times, but it still like gets me hung up because I feel like if someone's like, oh, I need this, I feel like, that's when they're going to buy because I feel like, well, it's a need versus, well, I just want it, but I don't need it kind of thing. So can you help like reframe my mindset around that? Yes. So you're asking if, if they need it, they, don't, they need it, they're going to buy it is what your, your mind is thinking? Yes. Okay. So you got to remember 
go back to your life. And you, what I always tell people, it'll help you hit reality when you literally look back on like conversations and how you you do things in your own life, right? Oh, I need to do my I need to do my homework. Do you do it? No. Oh, I need to do my laundry. Did you do it? No. Right? So when someone goes, oh, I need this, I need this. Oh, oh, okay, then do it. And if they're like, well, you know, it's more of a need, not a want. And I'm like, well, it sounds like you want it. So why don't you just do it? You know what I mean? You're telling me right now, I need it, I need it, I need it. Okay, well, if you need it, then make it I want, like make it happen. Like you're, you're, so this is when you get real with that customer, right? And you're like, oh, well, if you need it, then let's do it, right? And what's so great is if you're doing paper order forms, that's where you hand them a clipboard. Okay, great. Put your name, your address, your phone number, your info here. And if they hesitate, then you're all like, oh, you're one of those people. <laughs> now you're confusing me, right? And, and people that work with me know that I do this. Wait, 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 wait. I'm confused. I thought you said that you need it and, and, and you were all excited and you're ready to do it. Well, wait, you're confusing me. <laughs> so do you want this or you just need it and you're just wasting my time? And then the customer's like, well, uh, yeah, I'll do it. You know what I mean? And it's all like, <laughs> good, because you were confusing me. Does that make sense? <laughs> So for your need and want, the reason why you're getting tied up is because, like I said, when you hear a need, you're like, oh, this is the best customer. They need it. They need it. They need it. Right? But that need is telling you that they're not ready to say yes. Right? That need means they're just blowing smoke up you to make you feel excited and get excited about like, oh, you're going to love it. Oh, it's amazing. You're going to do this. Oh, it's great. Right? But what they're doing is they're getting your endorphins up. And then now you're emotionally attached to them buying that. And Thank then you. what happens is your emotions get in the way and then you allow them to dictate how the interaction's gonna end, right? So what you have to do is emotionally not challenge that need and you'd be like, okay, well you need it. Well, before I ask you the question, A, is it something that you really want? Is this something that you see that you can get? Is this something that you know you're gonna have forever? Is this something that you, you know for a fact that if I say, are you ready to get it, you're going to buy it? Ask them if they can budget it. <laughs> Vernon, I'm going to cut you. I'm going to cut you. I just want to say, I think, I think it's actually a trigger word for when they say need now. It's like, it's actually now, I just view it as this person's probably blowing smoke, more than likely. So I need to dig let me dig, ask a couple good questions to figure out if this is a person that's, again, dude, I, you guys have this customer. Like they come up, they're like, I need it. And I guarantee you, they did the same thing at the Costco booth. They did the same thing at the home show. They did it same thing two years ago at the state fair. And they just delay it and delay it and delay it. So as a salesperson, it's your job to try to elicit, is this something you're ever going to take action on or not? And like we use the line, like the only thing we really need is food and water. You can use that same line on a person that you can kind of tell is just like, oh, I really need to replace my chef's knife. My chef's knife sucks. I've been looking at this. Well, do you really like, I mean, we only really, really need a spoon of water, Mrs. Jones, but do you want a new chef knife? And they're like, well, I don't know. And then again, ask a couple more questions. And if it's worth your time, worth your time, right? Also, when a person says that and it's, I need, I need, I need, you're like, your person likes to spend money, don't you? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, because the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. And I love taking money from people that waited too long. <laughs> so do you want this now while it's on sale? Or are you going to wait until next year when it's more expensive? And they're like, okay, I'll do it. Vernon, did you need Boom. that dope ass chain or did you want it? <laughs> exactly. All right. We still got 10 more minutes for more questions. Brian Carter, and then we'll come down here for the next one. I love when Curtis says sassy things I know I can't pull off. <laughs> <laughs> and I love your, your confidence in me. Um, 
So I, I'm just genuinely curious. I'm so amazed by people who are so high performance like both of you and so many people in this room. But I'm even more amazed just knowing that y'all will continue to grow. Because growth is not automatic. We're not entitled. We're not owed growth. But I just know who you guys are in the trajectory of your own hard work. I'm genuinely curious. I feel like people on my level look to you guys, whether it's through mentoring programs or talks like this or cross training. I'm curious how both of you are sharpening your axe. When you're at such a high level, what are you both doing to continue your own growth and improved results? Yeah, you go. Um, so I think it's really important that if you have not sold $500,000 in a year, you probably need a mentor. Like that's just kind of like it's, it's, it's is what it is. Now I got to 500 grand a few years back and then what I kind of noticed at that point was there's so much content that I've taken that I haven't actually implemented. So for me now it's like I kind of got used to for like six years having a mentor within Cutco. And so they were kind of just created a discipline in me to again focus on sharpening of the ax. So again your library of notes guys in your a notes folder or in your like your binders, wherever you guys take notes, there is so much good that exists within your knowledge already. You just have never implemented before. So for me, how do I keep sharpening my axe? First off, just like continue being really intentional with your circle. Um, I've noticed that as I've hung out with the Texoma team, so shout out to you, Brian, and shout out to your team. Shout out to, again, the people like Brandon, the people like Matt who have been open enough to sharing what they did to create what they're creating. Um, it's like, how can you continue as you, again, you have to prove yourself first, right? Like, again, you just have to put in the work to get there to be able to have those conversations where a person will entertain a question that you have. Like, I didn't get entertained like six, seven, eight years ago with questions that I didn't even know why I was even asking them half the time. Um, but it's a discipline within my schedule every single week that I'm either, like I love YouTube and I love really good speeches and good graduation speeches. People at their peaks where they've done something really, really good, the lessons that they take from them and that's where some of my quotes came from today. Um, so I love being a nerd on, again, just how really, really high performing people tick. And ironically, I'll give you some news, they all just work effing hard really effing hard. Like that's just what they do. So it's like, what's your capacity for hard work? So I keep challenging myself, Brian, with that capacity. That was my thing this year. I was like, I think I'm re really working hard. And I just wasn't working as hard as I thought I could work. So I just was intentional with working harder. Um, so to answer your question, um, I have been experimenting outside of the cuckoo world with coaches and mentors um, over the last few years. But for me with, um, my schedule. It's just super intentional with making sure every single week, like again, the 34,000 miles that I drive, I listen to a lot of, a lot of audios. I listen to a lot of, again, things that are outside of the cuckoo world that are improving how my mind is working. Uh, but if I were to go back 10 years ago to listen to things that are really important, I think it's again, just getting really, really disciplined with your scripts specifically, just get better at selling knife sets, <laughs> just get better at that and you'll grow. Um, and then does that answer the question? I think. So first thing that I would tell you to do is record yourself in the script or the thing that you do. Um, <clears throat> I've listened to myself do the same script over and over and over. And I've listened to what areas of weakness that I have. And what I do is every year I record myself and I listen to things so that I can remind myself of the things that I need to be doing right. Um, you got to practice what you preach. And I think a lot of us preach, but sometimes we don't do what we preach. So the way you get better is you continually internalize and get better on yourself with what you're doing. Um, I'd also say that it's never good enough. Okay, 1.4, it's not good enough. Uh, I do feel that there's some things that could make it better. Uh, well, actually, I know there's things that could make it better. Um, so yes, I'm not satisfied. I'm not fulfilled. I know that some of you in this room, you guys fulfilled, you're fulfilled with your number, whatever number you sell, and this is what you do. That's great. But if you want to continually grow and you want to get better, you got to tell yourself it wasn't good enough. Okay? We're in sales. Nothing is good enough. Okay? You have a $20,000 order. That's not good enough. What about the $50,000 order? What about the $100,000 order? What about the million dollar order? I'm looking for that. Okay? If I can get three customers a year buying a million dollars from me, I'm out. Right? <laughs> but 
that that is a mental that is a mental thing that I think of, and I think that that's what you should do. Uh, the other thing too, ask those stupid questions that you think are stupid, okay? Because stupid questions are not stupid; they're curiosity that needs to be answered, okay? And there's many times where I want to ask that stupid question to some people in this room. And I know they'll be like, why are you asking me that question? And that's just because my curiosity is telling me they have something that I need that they're not giving me, okay? And they actually have something he wants. Yes, Correction. something I want. Um, but what it is is that I have to internally, you have to internally know that every person in this room has something to get back. And there's something that they're doing that's brilliant and they can teach you something. And to me, I have the best conversations, whether you're at 20K, whether you're at a million, whether you're at 10 million, you all have something to give to all of us. And if you want to sharpen your ax, be open and be truthful to yourself. Because once you are, you'll learn so much more about what we have to offer. All right, let's go here. And then we might have time for one more question. Maybe. So... <clears throat> So my question is for Curtis. You can keep it. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> my question is, um, you had a lot of really good questions that you had us write down. Um, my question is, how do you make sure, as you're asking customers those questions, it's something that doesn't turn into an interrogation and something that ends up being more conversational and helpful? Yeah. So I'm not going to sit there and just go, so I need you to answer these four questions before I'll talk to you again. <laughs> if you don't answer these, kick rocks, buddy. Um, so the thing is that if you're at the booth, and, and Bert knows this because we've worked Oklahoma State together and some other events, and the thing is, is that when you become emotionally detached or retired, that means that you're open to have conversation and have a conversation in any way or any direction that it goes. And there's more times where you can add that question in in a different way than what I specifically asked to get that information. So it becomes more, it becomes more of a conversation rather than just, hey, answer this, answer this, answer this, right? One, you need to laugh. Two, you have to get everyone involved. And three, make it fun and exciting and make it where it's inviting, where when you ask that question, it's not just, you know, hey, you came up to the booth. Uh, I heard that you said that your knives at home are shitty. Tell me what your knife situation is at home besides them being shitty, right? And then the customer's like, oh my God, if you only knew, like my wife could stab me and it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt me or kill me, <laughs> right? We all have, we have conversation when you're open those conversations happen and you're like, oh, has she tried to stab you? She's thrown a knife at me and it, it didn't do anything, right? You're like, oh, sweetheart, do you want a knife that'll work next time? <laughs> right? But what it is, is do you see what I mean? It's like you have to be open and you have to be less emotional about your questions that you're asking. Because if you're emotionally attached to the question that you're asking, it'll come off completely different than if you're just having a conversation. I think uh, what's really important in this, again, I you know you didn't ask me to ask, answer this question at all, but I think the importance of, it's, it, it ironically always comes back to the same thing. If you can be so in alignment with what you know you're supposed to say, you'd be surprised how the question that you're asking right now actually just takes care of itself because you're not thinking about the question you need to ask at all. When you're thinking, oh my God, what do I ask this customer next? You're already 10 steps behind. So it's like, hey, if you're so in tune with Again, the diligence of practicing, knowing what you say, and it's the same thing with objections. How do you, like if a person says, I need to think about it, do you have a knee-jerk reaction every single time that you know you can count on? Or are you having to think about that? Right, like Jason Jeffrey talks about getting to unconscious consciousness, which is literally not having to think about what you're saying next, it's literally just paying attention to the person that's in front of you and their body language. And once you get to that point, it's going to be a lot of trial and error. There are going to be awkward conversations and awkward questions that you ask. You're like, oh, I shouldn't have asked that at that time. But you have to just commit to knowing it's not bullet points. Questions are not bullet points. Questions are conversational. 
you have to look at them from a conversational standpoint like Curtis is talking about. And then you'll never look at questions as an interrogation. It's just naturally a conversation piece, if that helps. Very nice. All right. I think we can do one more question right here. We've got to have it a quick one, and then we will be done. Almost. All right, guys. Don't rush off. You did really, really good. Curtis, I've known you for a long time. And to come back and see you, so, and, and Bert, well done. Talk to you later. Um, but I want to say, oh, could you share with us your growth spurts? So when you were at half a million, when you were at 100,000, what was your mindset then? And did you have a coach? How did you make those leaps? Could you walk us through just quickly how you became the Curtis that we're looking at today? That's what I'd like to know. He worked really hard. Okay. <laughs> so your mic went out, and I, I heard just how, how's my steps or my evolve, my whatever. Yeah, so when I hit 100K, I can tell you this. Once I hit 100K, I looked back on my 100K year, and I did not work hard at all. Okay? And what I mean by that is there was a lot of times where I made an excuse of why I didn't work or why I should have worked. Does that make sense? So once I hit 100K, it was a like, I sold 100 grand and I really didn't even work. Like I, 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 and when I say work, I'm a workaholic. So to me, it was just like I had an excuse for why I didn't hit the number I should have. Does that make sense? It was a like, oh, I'm going to give my excuse. Uh, I just didn't do my phone time or people didn't pick up their phone. It just, right, I had an excuse about phones, right? And then it progressed where it was all like, okay, I can't have an excuse for that. I just need to do it and just get over that fear. Then I sold 186,000, right, the next year. And I was all like, okay, that was great, but we could have done this better. We could have done this better. And we could have, you know, and that's, I could have done better at service. I could have gotten my scripts down. I could have figured this out. Now, you got to remember when I first started Cutco, I was part of that program where they're like, you can't sell at the booth. And I was like, I am because I'm a college student. And I'm not driving two hours to sell to the person that came up to the booth and wanted a homemaker. Like, that's not happening, right? And then Josh Muller's like, hey, why did you sell that at the show? You know, that's not. And I'm like, Josh, I, no, we're not, we're not doing that. <laughs> then Josh was like, okay, let's talk about this. Let's, let's figure out how we can sell at the booth. And, you know, just under the, you know. That's the evolving of what started to happen. So next step was 180, and then it was like, I'll be honest with you guys, uh, at that time, Silver Cup to me was like the elusive award, right? Um, I lost Silver Cup the first year by $600, okay, to Joe Gaylord. Second year, I lost Tony Carlson because he didn't sign his CSP contract, so I lost to him because he was in my category, and that should have never happened. But that's... <laughs> That's what I was thinking, okay? That's what I was thinking. Next year, I sold 260-some thousand. I was, uh, I was, again, number two again. And then I was just like, you know what? We're going we're, we're gonna to get this, right? And then uh, that's, that my mind thought went into Silver Cup, right? Like, I can do this. I can compete, right? Then it just became number two, number two, number two. And then I was like, I don't want it, right? Deep down, I did want it, okay? But my program started to evolve. Does that make sense? So what it was is, okay, fairs and shows are doing really well. I'm known as the new Cutco script guy. I'm the new, the new customer guy. And anyone that knows knows that that's what I was labeled for the first 10 years, basically, of my career, right? And that's because I was like, you're going you're gonna to come up to the booth, I'm going to sell to you, right? Then it was, you know what, I'm really good at new customers. I really need to go at the low-lying fruit, which is past customers. So then I got really good at selling to past customers. Then I was just like, you know what, this service call program, it could be something instead of me just going show to show to show to show. And there's so many in this room that do that, show to show to show, have no service, which I would tell you, your answer to you getting better is get better at service calls and get better at service events. It's low-lying fruit. These people just come in and give you their credit card. It's ridiculous. So I literally got good with past customers. And then I was just like, OK, past customers are going good. New customers are going good. I'm at like 400, 500 for the year. Like, this is good. But then I was like, I still haven't won the Silver Cup. So what's the next step? Let's create this weird thing called the kids program, family program, right? Then I was like, let's focus on getting multiple sets. Then it was like, OK, I'm really good at multiple sets. 
oh, there's this thing called cookware. I hate selling it because they return it and I don't know how to do it and it's just terrible and this shit's nasty and I, I, can't, I can't do it. <laughs> then I told myself, you have to get better at this because if you get good at this on your service calls, that'll raise your average order, right? So then it became, okay, let's get good at cookware. Let's get that average order up, right? After that, the Evolve, it just started going. So what I tell you is that programs got better with Cutco. People got smarter. We sold more. Expectations started breaking down. I will tell you, sometimes it feels like you're in a tunnel and there's no light at the end of the tunnel because you're just like, okay, I got to be the first one to sell a million. Like, this is right. So what it is, it's just breaking down barriers that you put up in front of you, in front of yourself. So my thing is, is that it's just been a natural progression of, okay, if I can do this, I can do that. Okay, if that person over there is doing this, how come I'm not doing that, right? So now my focus has changed to business gifts. You, you get more right? So now once I get good at business gifts, then it's like, okay, if I sell 1.4 million in residential and I sell... I'm not going to put a number because I don't need Rob calling me and going, hey, you said this and that. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? And then I start getting that layer going. Then what it is is that then it, it's just going to progress. Does that kind of help you like know my steps? I don't know my numbers because there's a lot of trimmers and there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers in there. So. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being very attentive. Let's give these guys one more round of applause.